Okay, this is week three. This is the Renaissance in England, Italy, and Spain of Intro to Humanities 2. So we're going to look first at the Elizabethan age. Um, oops, I went too far. Sorry about that. <laughs> the, Eliz the English Reformation began as a political dispute, if you remember we were talking last week, about the Reformation with the German Reformation, with Martin Luther nailing that the theses to the church wall and how that started to split the church, the Catholic Church, between Catholicism and Lutheranism, which then gave birth to Calvinism and so forth. Well, in England, the Reformation began as a political dispute. Um, basically, King Henry VIII um, appealed to the Pope to allow him to divorce his wife, Catherine of Aragorn, because basically she produced no heir. And I know it's kind of ironic because most of his other barren wives just kind of got killed. Uh, but he decided he wasn't going to kill Catherine. He wanted to divorce her. The Pope refused to give an annulment, actually. Um, and so then Henry decided, you know what? I don't need the Pope. And he split with the Catholic Church and established himself as the head of a new church, which he called the Anglican Church, or the English Church. And he then divorced his wife by his own decree. Uh, he also confiscated any lands that was owned by the Catholic Church and sold them at a pretty good profit. So while rejecting papal authority, the Anglican Church maintained its Catholic religious beliefs and vigorously opposed other Protestantism, especially Lutheranism. So um, while they didn't acknowledge the Pope anymore, they basically were still Catholics. Um, after Henry, of course, he um, what his heir became Elizabeth. He really had no male heirs as his male heir died and as a young man um, being frail. So then we, we get Elizabeth, Elizabeth I. Um, the Anglican faith was reinstated and religious tolerance kind of prevailed. Elizabeth basically had a kind of don't ask, don't tell policy. She, um, she was outwardly obedient to the official uh, Anglican faith while she allowed Catholics to practice their own faith secretly. As for Protestantism, she frequently suppressed Puritanism uh, while whose Calvin doctrine threatened the royal power. Thus, while the European com continent was ravished by bloody religious wars, England kind of enjoyed relative peace prosperity and a cultural revival. This was known as the Elizabethan age. So the Elizabethan age, the religious divisions in England, uh, in English towns had virtually ended. Um, excuse me, the, the, during the uh, uh, Elizabethan age, uh, the religious divisions that existed had ended the production of what was called medieval drama cycles. Um, in their place, we start to see touring companies of professional actors, which presented plays um, in in courtyards and other makeshift theaters. Uh, actor companies were often censored by the town's authority. They couldn't do something that seemed to oppose the 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 power of royalty. Um, you know, they couldn't do bawdy stories that might. Uh, affect the citizens' mor morals. So, uh, in order to kind of avoid this censorship, acting troops gained sponsorship of prominent nobles who also employed the company to perform at their courts. So basically, they sought um, protection by having rich people um, subscribe to them and have them under their employment as official entertainment. Um, the biggest one, of course, being Elizabeth, who ends up being the patron of Shakespeare. So the end, the year of prosperity of Elizabethan theater began in 1576 when the Theater of London was built. This was the first uh, public theater 
uh, who is a permanent house, a permanent fixture, where popular plays would attract diverse audiences and civilians um, and average people could come in and um, pay a small fee. Uh, the theater was later renamed The Globe. Um, the famous wooden O where many of Shakespeare's plays were first performed. This was a theater in the round where the audience was surrounding the stage. Um, and it was a public theater. Um, and basically it was free from the city's censorship because it was under the patronage of Elizabeth. Um, or Elizabeth's closest nobles. Um, here, theaters were also handy for such alternate entertainment as beer baiting and uh, some prostitution. Uh, London's glittery Elizabethan society steam streamed across Thymes Bridges to see plays for a penny a mission. Even a humble apprentice might see dramatic spectacles that rivaled those of ancient Rome. So for a place where there was very little entertainment, this was a great place to be entertained. Uh, public theaters reflected the needs of their performances. They were polygonal or circular structures. So you had the audience surrounding the stage and they could accommodate as many as 2000 spectators. Because the stage jutted into the central bar, Yard, an actor standing downstage was surrounded on three sides by a noisy audience. So Elizabethan actors favored a declamatory acting style with broad gestures to demonstrate the character's emotional state. Also, the open air arrangement meant actors had to be quick enough to finish a long play before it got dark because there was an artificial light. Elizabethan plays were lively, drawing both classical and medieval forerunners. Most of the Elizabethan comedies were modeled loosely on the Roman playwright Plautius and Terence, whose plays were read in Latin by most uh, English schoolboys. Whatever its literary pedigree, Elizabethan comedy contained enough broad humor and slapstick to please an illiterate commoner in the pits. Also, comedies at this time were basically love stories that always ended in marriage. History plays or the Chronicles were also immensely popular in the patriotic aftermath of England's naval victory over Spain. The Chronicles incorporated elements of the medieval mystery plays with their panoramic biographies of saints and gory onstage torture. Uh, these were also heavily um, kind of uh, helping the, Brit the British monarchy. Um, they helped establish Elizabeth's authority on the throne, her, her heir to the throne, so to speak, by making sure that any other families, any other um, people that might be trying to get that title would not be deemed eligible. So they established her authority on the throne by giving a, a history that supported her. So these were very much um, propaganda pieces. Um, the biggest one, of course, being uh, the Henry V series. Uh, Elizabethan tragedy borrowed from the sensational plots of Roman writer Seneca, often mixing themes of revenge with severe Calvinist morality. Late as Elizabethan charities were all, tragedies were often set in Italy, which seemed the perfect setting for political intrigue, murder, and depraved sexuality. Also, the tragedies ended in a great popular fashion of almost everybody dying. I mean, there was carnage on the stage. You think shows are violent today? Uh, some of the Elizabethan tragedies, Shakespearean tragedies, were so violent that actors actually risk being killed on stage. Uh, the most famous one being Macbeth, who um, in the theater's superstition um, is said to, you're not supposed to say Macbeth in a theater, it's bad luck, because uh, allegedly actors died during some of the battle scenes because they were so violent. So in, 
in the theater you're supposed to call it that Scottish play. So Shakespeare was the biggest dramatist of the time. Um, Shakespeare's disdain for the classical rule of form favored by his university changed trained rivals who included uh, his younger friend and protege Ben Jonson. Shakespeare plays were loosely plotted with action that sprawled across weeks or even years. Instead of in imitating Latin poetry, Shakespeare shaped Elizabethan speech into what's called blank verse, which is a five stressed poetic line, pentameter, that feels both natural and dignified in English. Shakespeare um, may not have been a humanist, but, his but to his contemporaries, he was a poet of great humanity. Uh, one of his uh, rivals, uh, comrades, was Christopher Marlowe. Um, while Shakespeare was a genius of Elizabethan theater, he was provincial. Um, he was a provincial who, like many Elizabethans, came to London to seek his fortune. And he found rich opportunities awaiting him in the theater. Christopher Marlowe was one of his most talented contemporaries and pioneered the free, the verse form of Elizabethan genre, genre, drama, excuse me. Marlowe's play, The Historical Tragedy of Dr. Faustus, anticipated Shakespeare's great tragedies like Hamlet, Macbeth, Othello, and King Lear in its psychological depth and epic, epic sweep. Marlowe's Faustus is motivated by boundless thirst for knowledge and power which leads him into a bargain with the devil. Some people believe that Marlowe is actually the author of most of Shakespeare's plays, particularly his late tragedies. Of course, one of his most famous plays is Hamlet. Um, and that best re reveals Shakespeare's bond to the Renaissance. It's a tale of a brooding pr pr prince. Mm. Called home to Denmark from his university studies Hamlet is commanded by his father's ghost to avenge his murder at the hands of Hamlet's uncle. The uncle, Claudius, uh, has been elected king and has married Hamlet's mother, um, the widowed queen. Anguished by doubt and disgust, Hamlet delays by feigning madness, but finally orchestrates a duel in which uh, the innocents die with the guilty. In Hamlet, Shakespeare engages in the leading idea of the Renaissance, fashioned after Castilian's book uh, of the courtier or Hilliard's Young Learning Against a Tree. Hamlet cuts a fine figure and has an abundance of what Castilian called sprezzua. I'm not sure how to pronounce that. <laughs> Sprezzes tora, or nonchalance. He banters wittily with companions, improvises a court drama, handles a sword with deadly effect. But Hamlet's character is also touched by the skepticism of Mon Monteg Montagna, who questions whether humanity is much superior to the animals. For all its philosophical overtones, Shakespeare's Hamlet was filled with engaging action. Educating theater, educated theater goers might savor themes of moral corruption and philosophical speculation, while the unlettered commoner enjoyed a good show of wit, pageantry, and swordplay. Hamlet is in every way a paragon of Elizabethan theater. And don't forget, everybody dies. So it's action-packed, lots of fighting, lots of intrigue, there were ghosts and uh, a play within a play. Very exciting. Elizabethan music. Um, Elizabethan, the Elizabethan court's most gifted and versatile composer was William Byrd. As a composer, Byrd was forced to contend with his country's religious divisions. He fended off the Puritans who considered all sacred music mere popish ornament and wrote music for, the Anglican, for both the Anglican Church and his own faith. He wrote three Catholic masses, but was not allowed to be publicly performed in Protestant England. 
Like Shakespeare, Byrd excelled at all musical types, including the Monet and the popular Madrigal. Like Shakespeare and other Elizabethan artists, musicians adapted Italian forms to suit the English public. Thomas Morley was a composer and publisher who also popularized the Madrigal. At the height of the form's popularity, Morley published nine volumes of Madrigals in seven years. And here's one of Morley's most famous. April's My Mistress's Face. So you can kind of see um, the beautiful sounds there of the, the, the madrigal. Um, by 1520, Leonardo and Raphael were dead. We're talking about paintings here. Um, the only Renaissance master painter alive was Michelangelo. The Counter-Reformation was the Catholic Church's answer to Protestantism, and is, it is long, especially in Spanish, a new wave of religious enthusiasm. The revival's most important figure was Ignatius of Loyola, a Spanish nobleman whose spiritual exercises sought to imitate the sufferings and spiritual disciples of the saints. The exercises prescribed a program of devotion and prayer by which the devout believer might reproduce a psychological experience of the saints and so partake of their piety. Uh, he later, Ignatius later founded the Society of Jesus, or as known commonly as the Jesuits, and they defended the Catholic faith and spread Christianity to the New World. Uh, for the most part, they were the missionaries, the ones that went into um, Hawaii and Japan and China and um, the, the New World. The Council of Trent censored books and prescribed artistic standards. The Council declared, um, constitute not to give empty pleasure to the ear, but in such a way that the words be clearly understood by all. So that there was this censorship to create work, whether it's art or literature, that was pious and honoring of God. This pronouncement by the Council challenged two basic principles of the Renaissance, particularly in the music. First, it criticized complex polyphony of the sound of the style of Josquin de Perez and other Northern French and Flemish born composers. Second, it condemned the intermingling of religious and non-religious elements, which was common in Renaissance sacred music. So we had this battle kind of going on um, between music and art and literature that was for the common man and popular and then music art and literature that was religious in nature and they wanted to kind of separate the two but popularly people wanted them mingled so what there was this kind of fight going on italian composers um giovanni da the Palestrina 
abandoned secular composition, and later occupied several prestigious musical posts in Rome, and finally became director of the Pope's Sistine Choir. Palestrina, stately and flawless compositions were the high point of sacred music in the late Renaissance Italy. Musically, Palestrina returned to the sacred compositions based on the traditional plain chant. While using more restrained distance than just queens, he composed the Mass of Pope Marcellus in Six Voices to demonstrate that complex polyphony need not violate the dictates of piety. Uh, in the Kyrie, for example, he balances upward movement of the melodic line immediately by downward movement. Using these stricter bounds, the music is always full and fluid. Palestrina's elegant monet, uh, Super Flumia uh, Babylonis by the Rivers of Babylon, uh, matched the musical rhythms perfectly to the mournful words of the biblical text from Palms 137. In Palestrina's sacred music, imitative passages and choral phrases blend with exceptional clarity and grace. And he found this kind of way to mingle music with sacred texts. Italian dramatists derived their innovative comedy from ancient Roman comedy with stock characters in everyday situations. To the classical models, however, the Italians gave a new coherence of plot, usually the dividing the actions into five acts and providing its event with realistic plausibility. A new variety of com comedy or comedia was called grave, serious, or erudite or learned comedy because it was based on ancient models. But Italian uh, playwrights also freely incorporated local theor theor yeah, theoretical um, theater traditions and modernized plots. The realism of modern Italy uh, comedy owed much to the Italians' invention of stage design and machinery. Renaissance theater in Italy generated many of these innovations. Stage devices, plot structure, comedy, conventions that define the modern European theater as a mirror of reality. Comedy dell'arte. This is an improvisational comedy in which actors invented dialogue to fit the bare outline of a plot. Comedy per comedia performances drew freely on popular novels, gossip, and current events. The usual inc scenario involved a cast of a dozen or so stock characters including the innocent young lady, the spendthrift lover, or the stocky doctor. So here's a little bit from, from a clip. The world of Canadia mocks his servants and lovers. They're universal types that you see everywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> We use this diagram to look at the world of Commedia. At the head, you've got Magnifico. At the feet, you've got Zani. At the shoulders, you've got the first actor and the first actress. Then you've got the two masters, Pantaloni and the doctor. In the very center, you've got Columbina, the servant girl. At the hips, you've got Brigella and Arlecchino. At the knees, you've got the captain. And down at the feet, Zani. This is Magnifico. He's like an eagle. He looks down on everything. He's the leader of the city. When he dies, another Magnifico automatically appears. He's the most powerful man there. He's the head. He thinks. Down at the bottom is the Zani. And that's the one where you were leading with the nose. And the arms are involved in that. And the feet are the... They're the feet that want to come up, ooh, ooh, like a pigeon. Zani's a peasant, and he's come to the city. Everything is extraordinary to him, and he's extremely curious <gasps> and enthusiastic, because of course he wants to please and he wants work. <gasps> I've never been here before. Yes, I'm ready to please. He 
you've seen Manuel in Forty Towers? Oh, 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 no, Mr. Boggy, Mr. Boggy, no, oh, oh, yes, Mr. Boggy, yes, it's absolutely Zani, exactly Zani. So you had Magnifico, the top master, and a crazy Zani as his servant. From Zani grow all the other servants, and from Magnifico grow all the other masters. These are the two old men. You have Pantaloni, the merchant, the miserly old man, who is a version of Magnifico, who's lost his teeth. Everything about him is mean and vinegary. He's called um, Pantaloni di Bisogna, of the needy. He needs, he's got a lot of needs. These two old men live on the same piazza and they love to argue. The doctor is the man of learning who knows everything about everything but understands nothing. He's so weighed down with knowledge that he can hardly contain himself. And he waffles and he waffles and he waffles and he waffles. Oh, well, that reminds me. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, well, sweet little bit of bullet. You then have the two servants, Brigella and Harlequin. Brigella is the cunning servant, and Harlequin is the stupid servant. He's not stupid in the way Zani is stupid. He's stupid because he doesn't he doesn't necessarily use logic. He he's a body. Harlequin is a body character, whereas Brigella is a brain character. So to a certain extent, you're getting a, a minor Magnifico Zani going on there. Brigella is the master of servants and the servant of masters. So he's like a maitre d' in a hotel or in a restaurant. He welcomes the guests. So a little bit like John Cleese in Forty Towers. Oh, Major, Major, no, do come this way, General, do come this way. Well, we'll get you some parlor. No problems in the kitchen, no, 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 the food's fine. So somebody who's got a position and has worked very, very hard to get that position and has a uniform, so I'm very proud of his uniform. He can also be um, a great womanizer and he can fall in love with people and first actresses and things can be tempted by him because he's cunning. He thinks ahead. What's in it for me? What's in it for me? You know, any, any, any situation, what am I going to get out of it? Harlequin is intuitive and happy-go-lucky. He thinks he's gorgeous, because why wouldn't he? He's not immoral, he's amoral. He doesn't know the difference between right and wrong. He lives very much in the moment. He is very acrobatic. He's very cheeky. Anything else in the mask? Any other animals? A monkey? A pig? Always hungry? And it's like, you know, it could open his stomach and say that there's nothing in the fridge. Sew it back up again. Very, 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 very playful. Columbina is at the centre of the diagram. She is as cunning as Brigella. She's as playful as Harlequin. She's as good with the money as Pantaloni might be. And she can hold an academic discourse on love, men, marriage and life just like the Doctor. The first actor and the first actress are aristocrats. Everything they do is very, very grand. They take up a lot of space because they own it. Uh, they are serious, dangerous numbers. They are part of the court of Magnifica, quite capable of killing. The first actress may well have had a previous husband who has died in mysterious circumstances and nobody's quite sure whether she had anything to do with it or not. They are Shakespearean actors. They are the parents of Romeo and Juliet, or Macbeth and Lady Macbeth. It's a dangerous world they live in. It's the world of the Borgias, the Medicis, and the top players of the politics of Italy at the time. 
So the first actor and the first actress don't have a mask. We have masks and non-masks. Then what happens is that the non-masks act with the masks as if they were real. So you believe them differently. It is all a game. We know it's a game. We know that they're people who are wearing, that they're people wearing masks. But when I'm on stage without a mask, working with one of them, I treat them as if they are normal. So the game continues. The second pair of lovers are the young lovers, the teenage lovers, and they're the children of Pantalone and the Doctor. But they've been bought a fantastic education, which means they can move up the social scale. They could become aristocrats. They are just moving into the world of the grown-ups, so they don't really understand everything. They are, if you like, Romeo and Juliet. Lastly, we come to the two outsiders. <laughs> The witch is actually a 20th century invention, but she represents a magnifico of the countryside. She is dark, she is powerful, she is earthy, and she's the supernatural element. And she basically moves in figures of eight. comes from somewhere else. He is often a mercenary soldier. He could be Spanish. He is full of swagger and braggadocio. But in reality, he would do anything to avoid a fight. their shapes, their ways of walking. It's like a firework display. It's an exaggerated mirror of society. Okay, so that's the Comedy dell'arte. And as you can see, it's very much um, stock characters. It's very um, formulaic. But yet there's improvisation in the dialogue. Formulaic in the characters, formulaic in their interactions, but yet improvisational in the words. All right, the Renaissance of Venice. The grand style of Venetian music is provided as suitable accompaniment to a city's habitual pomp and celebration. Remember, this was the largest port city. So lots of different styles, lots of different languages, lots of different um, <clears throat> innovations, and lots of money. Uh, Venetian Renaissance painters preferred oil uh, with its rich hues and intense colors. Uh, Venice's most pop mysterious painter was Giorgione, um, and he was a master of the pictorial mood. In his famous um, painting, The Tempest, the city landscape, this is the Tempest, manages to suggest both profound peacefulness and kind of a foreboding. The figures in the foreground, the Sentinel, and the nude mother with infant remain largely unexplained. They do suggest kind of the contemporary qualities of strength and tenderness. And there's also this kind of hint of the religion in terms of the Madonna and Christ child form and the non-religious in terms of the warrior. Um, Titian contrast um, our last pain, painter, Georgione, with the life of Tunisian, a master of color, again look at these rich colors, who became one of the wealthiest and most successful artists of the day. When Michelangelo's uh, energies were absorbed by the new uh, St. Peter's Cathedral, Tunisian fulfilled commissions for Italian aristocrats. One of his most famous works, Bacchus and Adrian, uh, uh, Aridian, was a combination of the pagan spirit painted to decorate the Duke's country home at Ferrara in Northern Italy. The wine god Bacchus 
impetuously leaps from his chariot to wed uh, Adrian. The entire picture is dominated by this blue and gold and pink, reflecting the moods of the revelers who crowd in from the right. Torsten and movement of the figures are a sharp contrast to the restful harmonies of much of the high Renaissance paintings. So we have, you know, the Bacchus and all of this reveling and celebration, look at all this mood, and it's got again a circular movement here going in and around. We also had some women artists of the late Renaissance. Uh, so, Fenispa, <laughs> these names are killing me, and Gasola uh, excelled as an innovative portrait, portraitist whose works were sought by international clientele. What's interesting about her portraits is the subjects were usually engaged in conversation and play rather than just kind of mutely, mutely facing forward in almost like a mugshot form. These seemed active in it and had life to her portraits. Another portrait artist of the late Renaissance female was Lavinia Fontana who worked in the courts. And again, these, these are uh, artists um, were encouraged by male teachers and opened up the profession of painting to women. And again, we, we see a portrait that's active and has movement rather than just looking like a mugshot. Mannerism. Now, the dynamic intentions of Tanisha's painting shows the effect of the style that arose in Florence and Rome around 1520. This style, which is called mannerism, employed exaggeration, distortion, and expressiveness in an elegant and inventive play on Renaissance conventions. Scholars originally applied the term divisively, implying a deriv derivation or decadent style, but now they regard mannerism as a search for a new expressive method. These mannerists often toyed with the rules of perspective and proportion, highlighting a tension between the pictorial illusion and spatial reality. Carefully refined distortions of the manner of style are visible, particularly in this piece, Madonna with the Long Neck by Parmigianio. Um, the central figures violate the rule of proportion that had been elaborated by Renaissance studies of anatomy. The Christ child lulls in his mother's arm, kind of like a corpse. Um, the row of unfinished columns echo the Madonna's vertical form, but the use of perspective is unorthodox, abandoning the carefully balanced pictorial stay, style, space of Renaissance style. We see kind of a, a neck that's way too long and out of proportion and, and in a wrong kind of setting. We see an infant that's too long gated and almost looks dead. So we have this infant and Madonna, but yet we kind of seem to represent the um, Christ dying in the figure of Madonna, that the Flemish painting that's much more famous by Rembrandt. Uh, you see down here another picture that's kind of out of proportion. So we don't see things being proportionally styled correctly. Um, Pantormo's deposition. The painter Jacopo Pantormo Exalted in mannerism stylistic license. His scenes of the deposition contorts posture and compresses the pictorial space to create a sense of cosmic violation by the death of Christ. The gazes and gestures of the participants in this sorrowful drama lead the viewer's gaze downward to the picture's borders rather than inward towards Christ's body. So there's this movement down here rather than kind of moving in. In fact, that inner space seems almost void. You know, we're constantly being pushed to the edges rather than worrying about this center. Um, and here's kind of this close up and you can see this, this odd way of, of look of, again, the face and body don't appear proper in their proportions. Tintoretto's Last Supper. Mannerist's experiment with pictorial space freed the Venetian painter 
Jacopo Tintoretto to present traditional Christian subjects in dramatic new ways. In The Last Supper, Christ is nearly lost. You can barely find him among the disciples arrayed at the table's plunging diagonal line. The lantern smoke is transmuted into angels. See how it's kind of, we see the angels over here. Um, much as the wine and bread of the Eucharist are mysteriously um, transubstantiated into the blind uh, blood and body of Christ. So we have this kind of supernatural element here. And we can barely find Christ amongst all of these disciples and people. And then we have the supernatural angels kind of up here on the top. El Gecko, the burial of Count Orgaz. Uh, typical of El Gecko's church commissions is the burial of Count Orgaz. Painted above the Count's tomb in a small church, the painting shows El Gecko's command of color and philosophical depth. Look at how rich these gold pieces are. Um, the burial of Count Orgaz pays homage to a saintly knight at whose funeral Saint Stephen and Saint Augustine supposedly appear. In heaven, El Greco shows the austere figures of the Virgin Mary and John the Baptist imploring Jesus to accept um, the Count's soul. The clarity of color in the faces and costumes below yield an acid contrast of blues, yellows, and greens in the heavenly hosts above. The dynamic whole announces a new stylistic synthesis that would be called, later called the Baroque. So we see all of our funeral goers, our count, the two saints that are kind of uh, holding him, St. Augustine and St. Stephen. And then above here we have Christ being implored by John the Baptist and the Virgin Mary to accept his soul to heaven. So um, that is the bulk of our our late Renaissance and the early Elizabethan. So we will go on to the next one.